ability to a people um, and empower them to a, to a large extent where all this was absent. I mean, it's no, the, there is no doubt that the tribals in India have fought valiantly and heroically uh, through centuries against various empires, even under the British Raj. I mean, the tribal uprisings have been one of the most inspiring moments for, for any young Indian who, who studied history or went through school and college. It was a remarkable moment, I mean, when you read these heroic accounts. So tribals have been fighting against oppressions in one, one way or another. Yes, they failed. Sometimes they failed. Sometimes they've been able to force the authorities into, into bringing some kind of reform. But what we see today happening is also, at, in one way, a continuation of this uh, uh, uprisings and rebellion that in, in that the tribal people, I mean, the, histi the, the history of, uh, of tribal people in India uh, uh, represent, I mean, their heroic resistance against oppression. It's, I consider this also to be a continuation of the same thing, but much more than that. What has happened today in these tribal areas is that unlike the 60s in India, when we had middle class youth flocked to the Naxal Bari movement out of a sense of romance, out of a sense of frustration what, that we grew up with, and I'm also a product of that, we grew up with, we were attracted to the Naxal Bari movement because it was, it was something that inspired us, which made us feel that here was an opportunity, here was the way in which people could work to uplift and, 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 and uh, uh, removed the kind of oppression and exploitation that exists in the society. What is happening today is entirely different. It's not the middle class youth that is getting attracted. It's not the middle class youth that is joining the Maoist rank and file. And that is the most in interesting part, and that's the last point I want to make, um, is that you see, and this is something even recognized by the authorities. This is recognized and spoken, by, spoken on the floor of the parliament again and again as a reminder to everybody that the poorest amongst the poor, the tribals and the Dalits, are still are the ones who are getting attracted to the Maoist or the Naxalwari movement. And I think that is something that we have to keep in mind. What we saw, I mean, not just me, many others who went, Arundhati also went around the same time that I visited the, and around the, in the same area. So it's very interesting that our impressions are so, uh, at, uh, you know, uh, our, our impressions were so close to each other's impression. What we discovered was precisely that the, when people talk about the Maoists and the state and the tribals being caught in between like some kind of a sandwich, what we discovered was something entirely different. That on the one side, you have the Maoists who are actually tribals and that any honest observer who's working in that area including their ardent opponents, cannot fail to say, acknowledge. On the other side, you have sections of the same tribal uh, coming out from the tribal society, who are part of the Salva Judo. And then you have also some other tribals in between, who are neither with Salva Judo, not with the Maoists. So it's a very strange kind of a sandwich, which is made up of the same people on all the sides. They comprise both the bread as well as the cheese and butter, so to say. So they, they, the sandwich is made up of tribals all the way. So it's a very strange kind of a sandwich that we are seeing today emerge, where the point I'm trying to make is that when we talk about uh, what is happening, that one has to understand that it's, it's the tribals who are resisting, the tribals who are supporting, and it's, this is something which cuts across. And that's the last point I want to make before I close down. It's one of the most interesting experiences that I had in recent times was when I visited uh, Bastar in 2009. This was prior to visiting uh, the, 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 the so-called gorilla zone where the mouse are active. Um, uh, was, um, I attended a rally that was taken, by, taken out by a, 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 a group that, that had come up called Bastar Sambhag Kisan Sangharsh Samiti. This was Bastar Region uh, Peasant uh, Struggle Committee. Uh, that's the direct translation. 
The interesting thing about that was that almost all its leadership and its middle-ranking cadres, its, its activists on the ground, came from different political formations. Some of them from the right-wing, extreme right-wing Hindu, uh, uh, because they are also working in these areas, in ashrams there, who had been educated in those ashrams. Some from Christian-run Christian ashrams where they had been educated and brought up. Some were members of Congress or Bharti Janta Party, right-wing party. Some were members of CPI, Communist Party of India. All of them came from different bio backgrounds. Yet, the circumstances, the life experience had radicalized them to a point where they moved away. And the demands that they were raising, I mean, they, it cuts across. Whichever part of Bastar you go to, whoever you meet, this is something which is, it's like a universal demand there. We don't want to part with our land, and it's not a question of land price, because they say a very simple thing. They say that this land has been a source of a livelihood for generations earlier and generations to come. So how do you pr put a price tag to a piece of land? I mean, you say 500,000 rupees per acre? No, it's priceless for them. Second, they say that if the government thinks in terms of development, they said that why don't they help us with the, with the, with the things that we are asking for and we have been asking for? which is <coughs> allow us to improve our agriculture and agricultural productivity by building small dams, encourage water harvesting, providing rural credit that we require, or better seeds that we require. These are the things. So the point they're making is that the government claims that the only way in which the development can be brought about by opening up this area for industry or for mining industry, no, they say. We have something else we need. And this is what, because this will allow us to retain our land. Friends, it's very important also to note that in India, while we are opening up these new mining areas at a time when India's domestic requirement for, say, iron ore is less than 100 million tons, we are digging out more than 220 million metric tons, which means that more than 50% is exported. So we don't need to for our own domestic requirement. We don't need to even open up new mining areas. So it's also opening and raising a lot of other issues that have gotten linked with it, which is what kind of development do we need? What kind of industries do we need? Do we actually require to open up these areas to more, for more mining? What, what is it that the people want why is it that when they want better irrigation facilities, they see that that water is getting privatized and being prioritized for industrial use? So the water's resources are shifting and being honored at the expense of agriculture. These are the kind of issues that are coming to fore. I'd like to end here so that we can um, have question answers or clarifications that uh, like it. Yes, please. Please identify yourself because I don't recognize any one of you. My name is Padma. I'm from Andhra Pradesh. Um, I've been reading your articles for a long time in NPW and I, I find them extremely illuminating. Um, as we all know, the Indian state uh, since 1947 has only represented democratic and they must follow democracy within the party. <coughs> So I'm not in, in fact in favor of banning any, as a civil liberties, uh, we have always argued against banning because we believe that we are in a position, actually, if, if there was a level playing field in India today, the left and democratic forces are more than enough to take head on the extreme right wing forces in India. We are very confident about that. It's because there is no level playing field, because the left uh, radical left gets banned or proscribed in India and their ideological propagation and mobilization or organizational activities are, 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 are therefore uh, gets obstructed by, because they get banned and all legitimate activities for them becomes criminal uh, that, uh, that they are not in opposite, they, that they, 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 they face a very Hobson's choice of either surrender or carry on fighting. 
the way in which they are doing. So we believe that it's that's banning and prescribing. I'm sorry, but I will not agree with what you were saying. The ban Congress and BJP that will not help. You know, it'll send them underground and it probably uh, reemerge in the worse form than the Tea Party that you all are experiencing in the United States. Okay. The second thing is you are absolutely right. We even we who do, do definitely regard Maoist as a very important part of the resistance. Not the only resistance, not the only ones who are resisting, as being one of the very important part. And I, in fact, go a step ahead and also regard them as of being critical importance for their entire resistance. The very survival of resistance, at, in some ways, it also hinges on the survivability of the Maoist movement. I agree with you entirely that some of the things that they have been doing uh, are not just something that we, we find abhorrent, but it's something which is harming them in turn. This is something that has been relentless. And in fact, civil liberties movement like the, to which I belong, PUDR and others, we have our own coordination with democratic rights organizations. We have been fighting with the Maoist over this issue. I mean, there is this constant back and forth where we are trying to persuade them into accepting Geneva Convention, Protocol 2 of the Geneva Convention, and follow those principles unilaterally if necessary, even if the Indian state is unresponsive, precisely because this resistance is of great importance. So I agree with you entirely there, uh, that they must stop. Yes, please. My name is Mohammed, and uh, first I uh, want to thank you for this very eloquent discourse. It really has opened up uh, my eyes, and I'm sure several other people, to what's really happening. I have a two-part question. How do you take your activism and uh, and sort of educate the government here? Because at the end of the day, the United States really has a lot of influence. So are you doing something in terms of letting the right people here in the government know about the atrocities that are committed there? So that's the first part of my question. The second part is, how are you given access to these areas? I mean, if there's paramilitary there and they are under you know, surveillance, how were you able to get into those parts and, and just a follow-up question, can you tell us what the latest status is about the good doctor who's uh, been in prison? Let me start with Dr. Binayakson's case. Um, Dr. Binayakson's case, uh, it's operating at two levels. One is the bail applications to suspend his sentence so that he could come out on bail. That is one part. The other is challenging his conviction itself. So there are two battles that are going on legally, uh, simultaneously. One in the highest court, the Supreme Court. The other, which is the challenging the suspension, uh, the challenging the conviction at the the high court that we have, which would be equivalent to the federal court probably uh, in the U.S. Uh, scheme of things. Uh, as far as United States is concerned, certainly not. I mean, United States and India's relationship is like. Uh, is today so close to each other. I mean, uh, India is uh, fast aspiring to become a client state of United States, and we are moving very rapidly in that direction. So to expect that United States would play some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a positive role, on the contrary, there is, there is, there is some evidence to suggest that U.S. military. Israeli military and the Indian military are working very, I mean, they're